different duties to different publics. We have a duty to the people most directly affected by this material, the people of Afghanistan, and the course uh, of this war, which is killing hundreds every week. We have a duty to the broader historical record and its accuracy and its integrity. Uh, and we have a duty to our sources to try and protect them uh, where we can. And within those duties, uh, we have certain constraints. And those constraints are principally the amount of resources that we have and the amount of assistance that we can get uh, in dealing with such material. So for this particular case, um, we brought in uh, The Guardian, New York Times and Der Spiegel as our press partners because there was so much information to go through. Now those three organisations uh, didn't pursue getting this information into the public record as primary source material. They pursued getting stories into the public record, their own particular view on what parts of this material were. So it was our task to get the primary source material into the historical record where journalists and policy makers can use it directly. Now, there are innocent individuals named in, in this. There are, there are also individuals who are not innocent who are named. For example, uh, those, the chief of the radio station who uh, took um, bribes by American psychological operations. Is that an innocent individual or not? Would they be a target for retribution or not? Uh, there are many examples like that, and they ex they're very tedious uh, to work through. But un understanding the limitations, um, uh, we approach things heuristically, which is we understand which parts of the material are most likely to contain uh, names which are innocent. And that is why we uh, separated some 15,000 um, documents from the broader collection uh, for line by line review. And that has been happening. It's an expensive and difficult process, um, which the Pentagon so far has refused to assist with. They have stated, we are not interested in having a conversation about harm minimization. We are only interested in having all this material destroyed. Um, that review is approximately 8,000 uh, reports in, um, and once we get to 15,000, uh, we will release them. Now, a lot, some journalists, unfortunately, are innumerate. Um, that is, they don't seem to understand what it means to go through 91,000 reports. This is not going through 900 reports. This is not going through 90 reports. Uh, this is an, an extraordinary a compendium of information. And it is simply not economically feasible uh, for this organization without assistance uh, to go to do line by line reviews of 91,000 reports. Um, so we are then put into a position where we have to either delay release of this material for three or four years to conduct um, such a review without assistance uh, or separate out uh, those parts which are most likely to need line by line review and those parts which are less likely uh, based upon the US military's own internal standards. Now it appears that, uh, that the US military did not obey its own internal standards uh, in relation to keeping certain in relation to not using uh, identifying information uh, of some of its informants. Um, so that, that is regrettable. But in the end, if we are forced into a position, which fortunately we are not, but if we are forced into a position where <coughs> we would have had to have released all this material um, without separating out any of it uh, or release none, the value the extraordinary value of this historic record to the progress of that war and its, its potential to save lives uh, outweighs the danger uh, to innocents. So far, uh, the Pentagon has stated yesterday that, to its knowledge, no one has been 
um, injured as a result of this material. Uh, that doesn't mean no one has, but um, no one, as far as the Pentagon is aware, aware, and it's trying to push this case to the best of its ability, uh, has been injured. But in the same period of time, um, the Af Afghan government states that NATO killed 52 civilians in just one incident, and there's been numerous others uh, during that time. So we, we really do have to keep things in perspective. We are dealing with a war. Wars kill people. Wars kill many, many people. And if, if this organization is to play its role, uh, then we are forced to take difficult decisions. Uh, and this is an example of one of those difficult decisions. Thank you very much. I open the floor for questions. And uh, the first question I have there, the gentleman in, in the black. Could you please also introduce yourself? And I ask everyone to introduce themselves before putting the question. Uh, yes, uh, my name is uh, Carl Siegfried. I'm a member of the Swedish Parliament. So. Um, First, I just want to thank you for what you're doing, and I hope that Sweden can uh, remain a zone for free speech in the future, too. And that's also what my question is about, um, internet regulation and how that affects uh, WikiLeaks. In uh, Europe, for instance, we have uh, a data retention directive that's being implemented, uh, meaning that we get rid of online anonymity to some extent. Uh, we also have... Um, uh, some initiatives going on for blocking certain content on the internet. Uh, do you see this as a development that will eventually suffocate initiatives like WikiLeaks? There's an, a tendency to harmonization uh, presently between differing laws uh, from different countries. Um, and the European Union is perhaps the uh, clearest example, because as a supranational state with fast interactions, um, it tends to harmonize faster. Within that mix, there's all sorts of political opportunism that is occurring. Now, the data retention issue has long been contentious, um, and the German Supreme Court uh, two months ago found that data retention uh, was unconstitutional and struck out all existing retained data and in order that it be deleted. Um, now, the German Supreme Court found that there were cases where data pre uh, retention could be um, legitimate, but uh, they would have to be narrowly defined. And they would uh, have to exclude um, individuals communicating uh, with journalists uh, or ministers, for example. There could not be blanket data retention. Um, in Iceland, we have been involved in an initiative which has uh, passed the parliament there unanimously as a proposal, which then orders the ministry to draft legislation, uh, to uh, push in the other direction, which is to take the best uh, free speech protection laws from across the world, including from Sweden, um, and uh, create a system that is very attractive uh, to publishers and human rights organizations who are, are frequently sued or surveilled. Um, so I would encourage people uh, to not just, be re not just react uh, to abuses uh, of the press, uh, not just react to this um, advancing um, electronic uh, quasi-totalitarianism, as seen by uh, things like the Data Retention Directive, but rather uh, push in the other direction, uh, come up with new initiatives that uh, protect the rights of free people uh, to communicate and get important information out to the public. Um, I think uh, letting someone else uh, set your agenda uh, is, uh, means that you may win a fight here and a fight there, but in the long term you will drift off uh, into the agenda of these people. And so it's necessary to actually set out uh, your own agenda and pursue that. Yes, please, over there. You, you get a microphone from Ulf, so please introduce yourself. Don't forget to turn it out. <laughs> yeah, my name is... My name is Stefan Lingen. I'm working for uh, Afghan Solidarity. 
a small organization that has been criticizing the, the war in Afghanistan and Sweden's participation in the war. I want your comment on <coughs> Sweden's role in this. If you read, if you look in, in the, your material, you will find about 15 reports where Sweden is mentioned. Uh, what conclusions uh, can one make out of these reports? And have you had any reactions from, from uh, Swedish authorities about this? And also, I want your comment upon what Swedi Swedish generals say today in the press that they are looking into the uh, Swedish uh, laws to see if uh, your pu publications are compatible with Swedish laws. I, I see a, a hidden threat in, in such remarks. Uh, are you really safe in Sweden? Thank you. Well, I guess time will tell. But um, uh, no, I, b I believe the, the, the Swedish law, you know, law is a reflection of practice. And practice is a reflection of uh, the available technology and cultural will. So I think the cultural will in Sweden, which has led to the sustainment of those laws, is still quite strong. Uh, so generals can say what they may, um, but if the political will uh, and the technology uh, which gives rise to law points in the opposite direction, it's not going to happen. Um, ra rather, I see those remarks as um, an attempt to placate uh, the Pentagon. And people should stand up and take note uh, that Swedish generals are attempting to placate the Pentagon um, because militaries uh, do serve an important purpose and of course many of our sources are people from militaries. There are good people within militaries. Um, but for a, mil for a military to be good it must be independent and it must serve the will of the nation. Uh, it must not serve the will uh, of other nations. And so those generals in making those statements uh, need to be called to account to make sure they are serving the will uh, of the Swedish people and not the will of another organization. Next uh, is you there at the, at the end. My name is Hans Johansson and I'm a member of the Pirate Party in Sweden. Uh, my question is about the Pentagon and the, some media uh, saying that Wikipedia is je jeopardizing the security of soldiers and sources in Afghanistan. Isn't it to the contrary so that Wikipedia's exposure of a, a war, uh, 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 waging of war, uh, when we have indiscriminatory killings of innocent people, is actually saving lives in the future by making the military very keen on having a clean warfare. <coughs> Thank you. 